Now we are recording. Uh, so we're looking at Job. This is our second week. Um, we are going to go. It's 7:30 right now. We're going to go till about 7:45 um, to seven to eight o'clock somewhere in there. We're not going to really have a lengthy prayer at the end. I'm just going to go through. Okay. So a recap of what we looked at. Job is a book of extremes. It teaches us the, that the righteous, uh, why the righteous suffer. Um, God is always sovereign. That's one of the main themes of the book. Job wasn't perfect. He was blameless. Important. And also, we'll look at this tonight. Not everything that Job said was right. Okay, so let's let's keep going here. Job's friends helped the most when they were silent. That should always be a reminder for any time that you're helping someone or count, giving counseling of any kind. Job's best uh, profit was by his friend's silence. Uh, life isn't fair, but God uses things for our ultimate benefit, and what we do brings glory to God. So, any questions on anything we looked at last week before we get going on this week? No? Okay. I have one question. Go ahead. Uh, I was reading verse Job. It says sons of God. Who is he talking? Who, who are they talking about? Uh, it, the different translations translated differently. The angels. Oh. Okay. Uh, sons of God was was a was a was a common phrase for for angels. Oh. Okay. So, um, that's the short version. I mean, we could get into all kinds of stuff, but we're not going to. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, just to recap of chapters three through fourteen. Job consists of the very beginning, which we looked at last last week. That's like the introduction to it. Think of it kind of like a drama. Right. Uh, if you've ever been to see a play, it's actually lined out exactly like a play. Um, there is the first the first act would be the this the setting. You know, when he loses all his benefits in chapter one, and then chapter two he loses his health. So that takes us to chapters three, all the way to the end of the book. Consists of dialogues. The first set of dialogues is between his three friends, and they each take a turn talking. Job talks, then one a friend talks, and Job talks, and a friend talks, and a Job talks, and then a friend talks, then Job talks again, ending the section, and which takes us into the second section, which we're not going to look at tonight, where each of them take another turn. Now they're going to take a total of three turns each talking. So each friend, each three friends talks three times, making a grand total of nine, nine. times. And then there's going to be a, another guy that comes in and talks, and Job's going to give a lengthy speech, and... Uh, yeah, and then God uh, uh, directly converses with Job towards the end of the book. So just a real quick recap. Chapter 3, Job basically says it would have been better if I'd never been born. Uh, Job chapter 4 through 5, uh, Eliphaz speaks. Um, and his the, sum, the summary of what he says, punishment comes to those who deserve it. Just repent. So then in Job chapter 6 through 7, Job gives uh, a response. And a lot of Job's response actually seems like it's more... Um, directed to God sometimes than to them. And if you notice as you're reading through Job's responses, he's often very scattered. <clears throat> yeah. And I think that is, um, in my opinion, that's evidence for it being historical. Because when you're in pain, you are kind of are scatterbrained. You know, and whereas his friends will say more of directed response and stuff, he'll say this, and then one minute he'll be like on cloud nine, like, I, I believe in God, I, you know, I, I have faith in God, and the next he'll be like, God has abandoned me. <laughs> it's like, wow, right. wasn't that like two verses ago that you said that you're waiting on God and all this stuff? So um, that's from God in chapter six through, I mean, from Job in chapter six through seven, where he says, life is hard, between you and God it's even harder. <laughs> that's the summary there. Uh, Job chapter eight, uh, rather short compared to a life as in Job's um, last little discussion there. Uh, Bildad is the saying, name, friend's name. He basically says, name it and claim it. Repent and you will find hope in God. Just rainbows and happy times for, for people who obey God. Uh, and then Job in chapters 9 through 10 comes back again with, no one can understand God's ways. Please explain. And the please explain would be God. God, please explain what's going on because I just don't see what's going on here. Um, which you can see there, the main threats of his response, it's not even clear if he's responding to Bildad. And so then Job 11, uh, Zophar comes in with basically, you're an idiot and a sinner. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Zophar. Wow. You're, a friend of, you're a friend among friends. <laughs> and then Job 12 through 14 is the end of this section. Uh, and Job finishes it up by saying, you, you are neither wise nor sinless. I don't understand what is going on. So sometimes even good advice given at bad times is bad advice. I think that's kind of important, especially as you look through Job, you see that over and over again. Where one of the friends will, will say something, actually in, in a different context, it could actually be good. Right. It's just that in this context, even the good advice was bad advice 
well, for two reasons, it was given at the wrong time. But for the second reason, it was given amongst a bunch of other bad advice. Right. If you've got one good thing to say, don't say all that other nonsense. Just say the one good thing and make sure it's the right time to say it. So anyways, uh, any questions on that before we look more specifically at Job 3? No? Okay. So Job 3 is Job's uh, – Job is the first one to talk as we left off in, in – excuse me, the end of chapter 2 last week. Um, they're all just sitting there on dust and ashes and uh, not having a good time. It says for seven days and seven nights. Um, so keep in mind that all this is happening happening relatively quickly after the events. We just don't have an exact time frame. Um, so let's start with um, – at the beginning, he says, after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And then he goes on talking, but we're not going to look at the whole thing. We're not going verse by verse. So if you'll hop down to verses 12 through 15, why were there knees to receive me and breasts that I might be nursed? For now I would be lying down in peace. I would be asleep and at rest with kings and rulers of the earth who built for themselves places now lying in ruins with princes who had gold, who filled their houses with silver. So if you'd notice, one of the things, uh, one of Job's uh, biggest problems throughout his speeches is he, he has no purpose in life anymore. He's completely lost his focus. Yeah. He doesn't understand. And this is actually very common to people who are in a lot of times of grief. They don't really understand what's the purpose of continuing to live. What's the purpose to keep getting up, to keep going. Um, and obviously Job is having this exact same same problem, that death seemed better than uh, continuing to, to live. There just didn't really seem to be a point. Verse 17, um, there the wicked cease from turmoil, and there the weary are at rest. So he really highlights that, the idea that there are no more problems um, in death, and that really seems for him to be the highlight of the whole situation. You know, why keep doing this, You know, going through each day with more and more problems? And then in verse 19, um, the small and the great are there, and the slaves are freed from their owners. So all that we strive for in this life doesn't matter there. Because if you notice here, he said, uh, the small and the great are there. You know, all your life you you build a, you you work at building a name for yourself, and then, yeah. oh, well, you're at the same place. Um, and I actually saw a picture on Facebook that pretty much summarizes what Job is saying. It showed a series of uh, graves, and it said um, the, uh, a rich man, and it said a poor man. Well, and it was the same oh, picture because yeah. it was the grave. Um, and that's basically the, the same thing that he's saying here. Um, and then in verse 21. Um, to those who long for death that does not come, who search for it more than for hidden treasures. Um, I, I should actually read the verse before. Uh, why is light given to those in misery and life to the bitter of soul? To those who long for death that does not come, who search for it more than for hidden treasure. So here he doesn't understand really the concept of why am I being kept alive by God when all my joy is being stripped away. I don't understand why not just kill me and get, and get it out of the way. Right. But what he didn't understand is that even in pain, God still had a plan. And that's kind of a big purpose, a big point, and, and really all of Scripture is that no matter what the circumstance, God always has a plan for it. That's hard for us to do with. And a couple weeks ago, we looked at um, uh, uh, assisted suicide. And one of, my, one of my points for why I was against it was I was saying that we don't know what God has planned for it. Um, and it's basically saying that you you can only be in a benefit to God if you are in perfect health, which I steadfastly re refused. And this is one of my reasonings for it, is because just like Job didn't understand, so when you're in a time of pain, you don't understand. Um, okay, so verse 23, uh, this is more of a different uh, reading. Why is life given to man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? That didn't really make sense to me, so I, I wrote down uh, the New Living Translation. I think it has a better idea of it. Um, why is life given to a man uh, – why is – hold on. Let me say this different. Why, why is life given to those with no future, those God has surrounded with difficulties? I think that kind of more summarizes it better. It's kind of difficult to understand in, in all the other translations. I read in the ESV, the NASB, the NIV. Um, okay, so then in verse 25, what I feared has come upon me, what I dreaded that um, that happened – or has happened to me. And really, if you look at it, so he was worrying that this thing would come, and then the thing that he was afraid of actually ended up happening. Now, I'm sure not every single thing that he was afraid of happened. Right. You, you know what I mean? Like, if you think, if you imagine all the things you're afraid of, what are the chances that every single one of them happens? Very, very he probably slim. thought that maybe something would happen to his kids because of the way they were behaving. Maybe. But, but not. Like not, not all of it, maybe. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, maybe that was it. You know, you don't know. But my point being, 
there's a few things I want to point out. First off, uh, Job was focused on on the bad thing that happened. That's my, the first point that I'm trying to get across. And the second point is some bad things happen and some don't. You can't worry about tomorrow sitting around worrying about what will happen. If it happens, it happens. Like you can't – I hope that I don't outlive my children. But if I do, I mean I can't anticipate that. I'm not going to spend my whole life being afraid of it happening. And then when it happens, I knew this was going to happen. You know, It's like kind of self-defeating there. So that takes us to Eliphaz and uh, – Chapter 4, it says, Then Eliphaz the Timonite replied. So the first thing he says, uh, Think how you have instructed many, how you have strengthened feeble hands. Your words have supported those who stumbled. You have strengthened faltering knees. But now trouble comes to you and you are discouraged. Boy, way to rub it in there, dude. Wow. <laughs> so it's now your turn. Be pious and listen. <laughs> okay, thanks, buddy. Mm. Um, and then in verses 7 through 8, he basically says that Job's problems are because of his sin. Um, consider now who, being innocent, has ever perished. Basically saying, you're not innocent. You've done something wrong. You've sinned. Um, so that takes us to the idea that no matter how small, whether the sin was unintentional or unknown, somewhere along the line, Job must have sinned. Well, that's kind of, if you describe it like that, I mean, who hasn't sinned in their whole life? Right. Who hasn't accidentally sinned? But that's not the point that Job is making. He's making, yeah, okay, may maybe that's true. You know, out there somewhere in the, in the oblivion, I have sin that I didn't know about. But with that being said, God, the contrast here is between God's character and the character of the gods of ancient the ancient Near East, where the spirits of different things would get angry just willy-nilly. Maybe something you would normally do, they took offense of it today, that they didn't take offense to it yesterday. Maybe you did something and um, you didn't even know that, that you did it, but they've taken offense, so they've you know, followed behind and cursed you or something, and so you had to go to a, a witch who would give you a blessing or whatever. But in this, which was written sometime around that same time that those beliefs were very prevalent, completely removes that possibility from the equation. Um, since everyone is always guilty of some unknown sin, it's impossible to disprove the claim. You are suffering because somewhere along the line, whether you knew it or not, you sinned. Well, how? It's impossible to disprove that. Yeah. See what I mean? It's a claim that you can't answer. Um, and then in verses 12 through 14, this is this really makes me laugh. Out of all the things that is said, basically, I received a special revelation. Look at this. A word was secretly brought to me. My ears caught a whisper of it. Amid disquieting dreams in the night when deep sleep falls on people, fear and trembling seized me and made all my bones shake. A spirit glided past my face and the hair on my body stood on end. I received this special revelation. You're a sinner, and I know it secretly. <laughs> okay, buddy. Yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> Someone's been drinking the and drinking the special juice. <laughs> right. um, so then, verse 17: Can a mortal be more righteous than God? So since God is more righteous than you, you sin. Well, Job's argument wasn't that he was more righteous than God. Job never said that. And so his argument here that since God is more righteous than you, you sin is completely irrelevant to what he's saying. But he still says it. Like, he just ballsy on this one. Yeah. Call if you will, but who will answer you? To which of the holy ones will you turn? God is not going to answer you. Neither are the angels. Boy, thanks, buddy. You're just so wonderful at encouraging me today, wow. aren't you? How many of you have, have gotten encouragement from somebody that said this? God's not going to answer you. <laughs> oh, smack him. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, well, buddy. Yeah, thanks. Exactly. My kids just yeah. died, but thank you for that. <laughs> Um, so then in verse 3, he implies sin again. I myself have seen a fool taking root, but suddenly his house was cursed. Jeez. It's like one of those things where he's talking about someone else, but he's implying that he's also hinting towards you. Yeah, yeah. Like, what a jerk. This guy does not get the idea of what a comforting friend is supposed no. to do. So then in verse 8, um, oops, I skipped a page. Uh, but if I were you, if I were you, I would appeal to God. I would lay my cause before him. So God might have mercy on you since you are so cursed. Basically, you sinned, and you're but because God has cursed you so badly, if you just go to him and, and say, hey, I've been cursed, maybe God will take it easy on you because he's already whipped out so much lashing on you. What? <laughs> what are you saying? Like, this guy is completely crazy. So then verse 17 Blessed is the one whom God corrects, so do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. Now, this is a little bit of a mixed bag because technically, God does discipline those who he loves. Yes. God does bring times of testing so as for our benefit. Right. But 
not it, in this context it doesn't apply because what he's saying is God is showing you your sin and now he's reprimanding you for your sin but that's not true because he didn't sin not obviously ever but in this situation it wasn't caused by sin so then in verse 22 which takes us to the end of this little discussion here uh, you will laugh at destruction and famine and need not fear the wild enemy enemies you should feel no sorrow if you're following after God Wow, buddy. You're, you're really not understanding the idea of God here. Yeah. That was like the talk we had today about depression. <laughs> you wouldn't have depression if you were coming up for God. And so then verse 24 through 25. You will know that your tent is secure. You will take stock of your property and find nothing missing. Ha ha! You will know that your children will be many and your descendants like the grass of the earth. Now, did you hear what he just said? This is somebody who just lost all of his children. Did you hear what he just yeah. said? You will know that your tent is secure. You will take stock of your property and find nothing missing. You will know that your children will be many. After he just lost his kids. Yeah. That's what he says to him. Thanks, buddy. That's wow, with friends like you, who needs enemies? I mean, honestly, who needs them? Wow. So basically, it's your fault. But if you repent, things will be trouble-free. So he's wrong on a number of different, different levels. First off, it wasn't his fault. Second off, he didn't have to repent because he didn't sin. Right. And that's one of the one of Job's big complaints throughout the book is, what is there to complain? To, uh, what is there to repent of? Just show me where I've erred. What, what have I done wrong that I need to repent for? Just tell me. And then the third thing that he's wrong, things won't be trouble free just because you're seeking after God. So on all accounts, this guy's wrong. He gave the wrong advice at the wrong time. He's just wrong. So that takes us to the, past the first little thing. Job just simply is saying, man, my life is hell. I hate it. And Eliphaz feels the need to, to give this long, long, unhelpful speech about literally nothing. He spoke all that time and said nothing in that whole speech. So then this is Job's response uh, in chapter 6. Starting in verse 7 through 9, I refuse to touch it. Uh, he's talking about food. Um, Such food makes me ill. Oh, that I might have my request that God would grant what I hope for, that God would be willing to crush me, to let loose his hands, to cut off my life. So obviously we see here that he's dealing with severe depression. He's not eating. And uh, he says that in verse, uh, verse 7. Mm -hmm. He's just kind of laying out there, just wasting away. Right. Uh, and what's, what's worse is he just kind of hopes that God will kill him. So um, we know in modern medicine uh, these symptoms are very obvious. You know, you stop enjoying things, even things that you used to get great pleasure from, yeah. and you literally have no energy with severe depression. We see all these things. <clears throat> so verse 14, uh, anyone who withholds kindness from a friend forsakes the fear of the Almighty. So basically what he's saying is by not comforting me, you guys are not obeying God. And this is very much so a directed uh, attack against his friends. If you read through the rest of the right. things, you know, he says, My brothers are as undependable as intermittent streams. <laughs> hmm. Verses 24 through 26. Teach me and I will be quiet. Show me where I have been wrong. How painful are honest words. But what, but what do your arguments prove? Do you mean to correct what I say and treat my desperate words as wind? Sometimes when we're dealing with people with, I just want to, Friends, that really quickly, people who are struggling with things, we are quick to judge every word that they say. Like, uh, that thing's not theologically correct, but people in pain say stupid things sometimes. You don't have to like, literally correct everything that they're saying. No. You know what I mean? So, uh, okay. I, my finger twitched. Job was not being arrogant, but he was speaking out of hurt. What have I done? Just tell me what I've done. And then... We'll take it from there. You guys are accusing me of something that you're not even clearly addressing what I'm saying. So Job's mood switches drastically during his speeches from confidence to complete despair. This is kind of a big point as you read through them. You're not going to find a whole lot of um, uh, continuity in his speech. You're going to find where he's talking here, and then here it sounds like a completely different thing. Um, it appears as though at least some of Job's friends were envious. If you read through the book, mm -hmm. some of their responses yeah. kind of seem like they were waiting for something to happen to him so they could have the upper hand. All right. You know, you can kind of see it in the life as a speech, but then you see it later on too. Um, so then that takes us to Bildad. Bildad, I'm um, sorry, no, that we have one more chapter of Job. I'm sorry, I missed it. Um, that takes us to verse seven of chapter seven. Remember, O God, that in my life, that my life is but a breath. My eyes will never see happiness again. 
You and I aren't equals, and you have attacked me beyond my strength. Have you ever been in a place where, where, where literally you prayed something like this? It was the craziest thing. I really haven't given Job much thought at all. This book just kind of just doesn't really interest me. However, one time I was going through severe depression, and I was praying a series of things, and I read Job, and I understood what Job was saying for the first time in my life because I prayed the exact same things that he had prayed, not knowing that he had prayed them. Wow. Like, for instance, one of the things that I had prayed was, God, what have I done wrong that you are picking on me? Why are you following after me, just trying to destroy me? And that's exactly what Job said. It's like, whoa, holy smokes. Um, but, you know, some things in the Bible you just kind of learn by experience. <laughs> so basically you're saying, God, you and I aren't equals. You're attacking me. Just remember all this stuff that I'm, I'm just a breath. Like, just remember that. Um, verse 12. Uh, am I the sea or the monster of the deep that you put me under uh, guard? They approached him as though he was the enemy and he was wrong. Th his friends literally came up to him with with the idea that he was wrong. Yeah. With the idea that he was the enemy. With the idea that he needed to be corrected. And then verse 19, why won't God leave me alone? We all looked at that. Um, and then obviously verse 20, com compared to God, what significance am I? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, then Job 8, that takes us to Bildad. And Job, Bildad really doesn't say anything um, of worth. But I do want to point out that we always think we can solve everyone else's problems. And verse eight, chapter 8, verse 3, does God pervert justice? It is unjust for God to allow bad things to happen to good people. Yeah. See, that was their key understanding that was wrong. Basically, what, what the, all of them are saying, it is unjust for God to allow bad things to happen to good people. It's unjust. No. Where are you getting that from? Yeah. Well, because they're good people. See what I mean? That's just – they started off on the wrong with the wrong understanding, so therefore every advice that they gave was tainted. It's not unjust for God to allow bad things to happen to good people. It's not unjust at all. He can do whatever he wants. Yeah. Uh, bad things ha bad things happening aren't just a result of sin. God didn't act unjust. The rain falls on the righteous and the wicked. Everyone will die, and physical death is not the end of the matter. No matter what happens in life, it doesn't end a death. Um, take, for instance, the those who are martyred. God allowed them to be martyred. Was that unjust of him? No. He even told them, you're, you're going to die for my sake. But verse 4 um, says... When your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. So Eliphaz said, it's your fault that, that yeah. they died. And Bildad said, it's their fault that they died. <laughs> Boy, thanks, yeah. buddy. Wow. Um, so, it wasn't, um, so it wasn't your fault, but they sinned. <laughs> thanks, Bildad. Um, were you done with that? No. Any questions on any of this so far? I'm just wanting you to see the overall of the book. I expect you to study Job on your own. I just want to show the, the way that it all flows together. Um, chapter 9, starting in verse 17, it says, He would crush me with a storm and multiply my wounds for no reason. See, and then in verse 23 through 24, because I want to kind of say this together, When a scourge brings sudden death, he mocks the despair of the innocent. He's talking about God here. He mocks the despair of the innocent. When a land falls into the hands of the wicked, he blindfolds its judge. He makes it where there is no justice. He makes it where the weak and, and, and they're taken advantage of it and they laugh about it. And then he says this at the end of verse 24, if it is not he, then who is it? See, he, he understands that, that, that God is the one who is sovereign. He, that's not the question here. The question is, he is picturing a God who is terrifying, amoral, now, just to point out the difference, immoral means you know what is right and wrong and you choose not to do it. Right. Amoral means you have no idea of what is right and wrong. So it's not that you're purposely being evil. You just simply have no idea what is right and wrong. Mm -hmm. um, which the people of Nineveh that Jonah was to go to, it seems like they were amoral, not immoral. Mm -hmm. Big difference there. The people of Canaan, on the other hand, it seemed like they were immoral. So anyways, just a small point. Um the God that, that Job pictures throughout these throughout this chapter here, he is a terrifying amoral power that is above the idea of right or wrong. And this is one of the key points that, that I want to point out. Job, not everything that Job says is right. Now, see, we're going to have a little bit of problem with this because at the end of the book, God says, Job has said what is right about me, and you have not. So keep that in mind 
We're going to come back to that. Okay. Just hold on to that. We'll come back to that. But not everything that Job says is right. Okay, That's one of the biggest problems that people have. They just go into the book with this understanding. Everything that the friends say is wrong. Everything that Job says is right. Well, if you go into the book with that understanding, you're going to be wrong. You're not going to understand the book, and you're going to get frustrated. Yeah. So Job's words are not all wrong or all right, the same as the three friends. It is the words of a struggling man in deep pain, whereas yeah. the words of the friend friends are words of the arrogant, right. prideful people. Oh, yeah. I mean, what else is there to say about that? Huh. Um, Job's friends want to prove he is a sinner. They want to, uh, uh, But Job wants to prove that God brings disaster on sinners and blameless people. See, Job doesn't know. Job doesn't know that the idea of his world, uh, uh, that the worldview that his friends have is wrong. His main contention here is not necessarily that bad things happen to bad people and good things happen to good people. He's just simply saying, I did nothing wrong and something bad is happening to me. Mm -hmm. See, Job doesn't have the, under the full understanding that we have because we have the New Testament. We have the rest of the Old Testament. Job doesn't, apparently didn't have any of those things. Right. Maybe he had the law, maybe, but probably not. So, uh, God, we see here God prizes sincerity more than theology. Remember that. God prizes sincerity more than theology. Not everything that Job said was right, but he was sincere to God, and God overlooked the, the wrong things that he said. The, the, by the theology of the day, the things that the friends were saying were true, but they weren't in, in reality, but they thought they were true because it was theological. And yet, they were reprimanded by God. See what I mean? So, uh, then in verse 33, we see what seems to be a very clear, in my opinion, uh, prophecy of Jesus. If only there were someone to mediate between us, someone to bring us together. Oh boy, I wonder who that could be. Hmm. Someone to remove God's rod from me. Oh boy, I wonder who that could be. In fact, I think that's pretty much exactly what Paul says in Romans. Yeah. So, that takes us to a very important idea in the book of Job. Is God good? And this is constantly brought up. If God is all-powerful, but he doesn't act on it, does that make him good? See what I mean? And, and that, a lot of the questions asked from a bunch of different things. One of the people says, it, God is above right and wrong. Right and wrong is for mortals, and then God can just do whatever the heck he wants. Then some of the people say, well, everything that God does is good, so anybody who does good, you know, God will do good to them because they deserve it, basically. So... God is sovereign. Job, the book of Job clearly shows that. God causes bad things or allows evil, whatever, how, whichever way you want to look at it. You could say that God caused the problems on Job and technically be correct because he allowed Satan to do it. Or you could say that he didn't do it, but he allowed it to happen. But either way, it had the same result. So you're left with still the problem of, so God isn't sovereign? Well, no, he is sovereign, but he allowed evil. So then, is he evil? See, and it leaves us with that with that question. It keeps looking at this over and over again from 15 different angles. By answering Job at the end of the book. Now, this is something that's not necessarily clearly stated. Um, in, in the wisdom literature of the Bible, things are oftentimes not stated clearly. You have to think about it. Okay. Now, I'm not giving you a full answer. I expect you to go and read Job and get the full answer for yourself. Uh, but just like when you read through Ecclesiastes, it seems very confusing. By answering Job at the end of the book, God proved that he did care, that he was sovereign, and that suffering will come to this world. This is exactly what Jesus would, would later say uh, thousands of years later. In this world, there will be troubles. Exactly the same thing. So if we look at Genesis 3, we see that each of us deserve to, deserves to be dead right now. Every, every day that we're alive is a gift from God. Right. Because Genesis 3 said, on the day that you, sin, that you eat of the fruit, you will die. But God didn't fulfill that promise instead he allowed us each to to live a life right. when we didn't deserve to live a life see what i mean so rather than saying god it's not fair that i'm you know i'm gonna have this illness or whatever well we're all gonna die but each second of life is a blessing see we're looking at it backwards mm -hmm. we're looking at it with death being the starting point when we should be looking at it as life being the starting point so uh but god will answer and break through the longest nights Real quick, chapter 11, um, th his loudmouth friend, uh, Zophar, basically says, you need to be harsher. They had already been harsh, but it sounds like maybe he's egging them on. Are all these words to go unanswered? Dude, 
what have these other friends been doing this whole time? They've been answering his words. You need to calm down with that. And then uh, in verse 4, you say to God, my beliefs are flawless and I am pure in your sight. Yeah. Job, you're super arrogant. Let me just be the first one to tell you that. You're, you're super arrogant. Uh, you who just lost your children and, and your whole household, yeah, hey, you're super arrogant. Uh, okay, buddy, you're, uh, you, you know, once again, you're really missing the whole point of this. Oh, I wish that God would speak, that he would, op that he would open his lips against you and disclose to you the secrets of wisdom. For true, true wisdom has two sides. If only God would show you how arrogant you are. But don't worry, I, I got this. I'll explain to you how, 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 you, how you're wrong. Um, and then in verse 7 through 8, can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens above. What can you do? You sinned and you don't even know it. You're too stupid to even know that you sinned. <laughs> so then verse 11, I mean, really, this guy is just oh, really going at really? it. Like, this isn't just unhelpful advice. I mean, it's just plain hurtful. Um, then verse 11, surely he recognizes deceivers, and when he sees evil, does he not take note? Your righteousness is just a show. And envious much, I'm saying that about Zophar, not Job. Like, this dude is super envious of Job, evidently. And now that this has happened, he can't wait that he finally has the upper hand over this guy. Like, yes, finally! <laughs> and then in verse 12, he says something that's just plain wrong. It can directly contradicts the book of Proverbs. But the witless can no more become wise than a wild donkey's cult can be born human. No, the wise can't. I mean, the, 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 the stupid can become wise. Proverbs affirms that, like, time and time again. Mm -hmm. um, and then in verse 14, again, he is relentless with this point. If you put away your sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent. Again with the, you're a sinner. Buddy, we get it. We got your point. You okay, think that Job is worthless? We that, got it. <laughs> don't be that dead horse. So then Job finishes up this with chapters 12 through 14. Job failed to understand that in wrestling with God, he is moving in the direction of a right relationship with God. Job failed to realize that by the struggle, it was benefiting him spiritually. He didn't understand that. He didn't understand that there was purpose for the pain. I think a lot of people, even to don't, stay, is, don't even, I mean, they, yeah. they don't think at that moment. Right. You know, they just right. feel oh, yeah. the pain at the moment. Right. They don't care what else is going to come later. Right. right. Yeah. Absolutely. Job lacked foresight that A, things wouldn't always be like that. When you're in, oftentimes when you're in a, in a dark place, things won't always be like that. Uh, B, his suffering was a necessary part of maturing. It was a necessary part of maturing. At the end of the book, he even says that he said, you know, I I heard about you, but, but now this has gotten a whole lot more real. So... My bad. And then uh, C, God had a plan for his suffering and was working through it all along. God was in it from the start to the finish. He knew that Satan was going to come. He already ordained the whole thing. He totally understood it. Totally, totally, totally puts a new perspective on it. But Job lacked that perspective. Um, obviously, he didn't have a Bible to turn to. So in verse 2, doubtless you are the only people who matter and wisdom will die with you. You're the only smart ones in the whole world and I'm just such an idiot. Um... So then here, the tents of marauders are undisturbed, and those who provoke God are secure, those God has in his hand. Basically, the wicked prosper. Why am I seeing the wicked prosper, and I, who did nothing wrong, am suffering? Now remember, there has been no justice served. Those people who took his flocks, they, they're fine. They came and raided and left. They're fine. No justice has been served. So he's literally talking about how their tent has prospered and how his tent has been torn down. Literally. Um, chapter 13, verse 5. If only you would be altogether silent for you, that would be wisdom. Job knew he didn't understand God, but all the friends wanted to all the friends wanted to do was tear Job down. Job knew he didn't understand the situation, but his friends they all thought that they knew what was going on. Um, and it seems like they didn't even want to encourage him, honestly. No. Uh, verses 8 through 9. Will you show him partiality? Will you argue the case for God? Would it turn out well if he examined you? Could you deceive him as you might deceive a mortal? Basically what he's saying here is you are accusing me of being a hypocrite to God. But you're the ones who are pretending to be more righteous than you are. And if the shoe was on the other foot, do you think that you're sinless? Do you think that you deserve to not be punished and I do? Right. Do you do you think that uh, uh, or uh, maybe Job isn't saying all the right things, but the friends were trying to flatter God. They were trying to get on his good side and prove that they were more righteous than Job. And Job's clearly calling them out, like, um, let me just kind of stop you right there. 
So verses 10 through 12, um, he would surely call you to account if you secretly showed partiality. Would not his splendor terrify you? Would not the dread of him fall on you? So some things they said were true, but they didn't apply to Job. Your maxims are proverbs of ashes. Your defenses are defenses of clay. They, they, ha they don't fit here. The things you're saying, they don't apply to the situation that we're talking about. They're ash. They, you need to realign what you're saying, guys. This is the, you are literally saying nothing. Chapter 14, verse 14. Um, if someone dies, will they live again? All the days of my hard service, I will wait for my renewal to come. So here again, Job points to hope again. Again. Don't worry, it won't last. Of course, with friends like these around, how could it last? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but anyways, Job didn't know what happened after death. But however, there is a possible uh, – it's called foreshadowing when something uh, in the Old Testament points to a greater fulfillment. There is a possible implication of second life here, talking about the life in heaven. Because remember, Job didn't know about these things, but then he said, if someone dies, will they live again? Now, obviously, he meant it as a rhetorical question for no – but it kind of points to a bigger thing that would be later revealed in the rest of Scripture that the answer is actually yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, they will live again, which gives us even more hope. See, the, the reason why the book of Job has to be a book of extremes is because it has to relate to us. If it wasn't extreme enough, it wouldn't relate to us. Well, okay, Job suffered some pretty bad things, but I've suffered worse. Well, no, actually, anything that you suffer on this earth, Job suffered it. So you yeah. see what I mean? So it's, he's able to relate to People. us. Yeah. It had to be suffered. It had to be so extreme. Well, you know, uh, uh, maybe, you know, a lower demon was attacking, you know, Job, but Satan himself was attacking me. No, Satan himself was attacking Job. We don't have to cast secret demons out of out of things. Satan himself was attacking Job. See, that gives us a lot more perspective, and we have a fuller revelation. We know that life is going to end with death. So how much more hope do we have? See what I mean? The book of Job is, in essence, a book of hope. Because it points us that there is meaning to our pain. So any questions on any of the things we looked at? I know, once again, we weren't able to go verse by verse because I didn't want to be in Job for the rest of the world. <laughs> I remember how long we were in Proverbs, and I'm like, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> we're not doing that. So, uh, okay, the riddle of the week, riddle of the week what, is the end of a, what is at the end of a rainbow? So were there any questions or comments on this? No? We're all good? People still do the same thing that Job's friends did. Yeah. You know, especially yeah. whenever you lose like a like a, a kid. Yeah. It's like, oh, why did you know, or like a. You must have sinned if your child died. Right? Or like a kid losing a, a parent, mm -hmm. and the kid's questioning. You know, it's. I think it's really sad that. Yeah. That yeah. And then they have to carry that weight their whole life of, yeah. did my parents sin and that's why they died? Yeah. Or did I do something wrong that God didn't think I needed my parents? Yeah, like sickness or something. I mean, like, they, uh, it applies to everything. People are just so... Did, did, Chuck, did Chuck just not have enough faith that his kidneys fell? They told my parents that it was something they did while I was born with. So <laughs> Birth defects. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> it's like, if you don't have something to encourage you, just don't. Just don't say anything at all. And that's why I brought up the thing at the beginning of the book, that the best that Job's friends ever did was when they were quiet. It's okay to not have the answers. It's not okay to open your mouth like they did. That's a terrible idea. Don't do that. No, uh -uh. So, uh, anything else though? No? Okay, I'm going to stop the recording. Were you going to say something? I think that where I'm coming from, um, it, it, things like this are been said. Mm -hmm. And I've heard it. And I think a lot of people, um, I'm not talking about Christians, maybe to a certain extent too, but... If they don't know the Bible, they would say what they hear. Yeah. Exactly. So they believe that, yeah. and of course they they just it's just a cycle. It just keeps going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, to to different people. Like me, I didn't know that that's that's not what it's in the Bible. So me not knowing the Bible, I probably would have said the same thing. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's where where all these is coming from. It's just from generation it's been said. Yeah. And people like my grandma. My grandma never read the Bible. And that's what she believes, what people have been saying around, that's what she's been saying. Yeah. You know, it's just, yeah. 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 a lot of people, oh, yeah. they just don't have the knowledge of what the Bible says, so they just... Which brings a very important point up. Where did the special revelation from Job come from? Because yeah. like Diana pointed out just now, people, 
this is not really what people believe. People believe what they want to believe, and then they just tell it because that's what we believe. And all of Job's friends, and even Job himself, reflect the culture that they lived in. Yeah. So where did this greater idea about uh, uh, of, of suffering, yeah. where did it come from? And that kind of implies that it came from God, because this isn't how people think things work out. Not that, but when people write a story, they want the righteous character to be more relatable, so they'll have him always say the right thing and always be in a good mood and, all, and never fail. And, I mean, look at how many in the church. I mean, you were talking about people not in this church. Think about how many people in the church do that. You know, yeah. oh, well, I've got to, I've got to always have my...